Welcome to Cocktails and Cuisine. This is a show about modern cuisine with a flair, with a twist. And cocktails with a flair and a twist. Taking the ordinary and making extraordinary. Making your everyday meals into something extraordinary. And I'm the chef, James Jens. I own Dinners with Class in Wisconsin, where we like to have a few cocktails and we have unique and inventive cuisine. So the cocktail today, we're gonna to do a smoked cinnamon rum cocktail. It's a great fall drink. To start, do equal parts of dark rum and light rum, your favorite of whatever. And then half a part of Pim's number one. The Pim's liqueur is a gin-based liqueur. To that, we're gonna add a little bit of reduced apple cider. And an egg white. And you'll wanna save the yolk for our next dish. And, all right, well, this looks like it's not gonna work. Let's strain a little bit of this off and we'll mix it in this other glass. And you can strain it into your clean cocktail glass. And for a garnish, thin slice of apple. And if you want, you can char the cinnamon stick and float it in. Now we can start working on the dessert because that has to go in the oven, cool down, and be able to serve. So we might as well make use of our time properly. So now we're gonna start with the chocolate espresso creme brulee. Uh, I love creme brulees. Uh, whenever my wife and I go to dinner, I'm always a person that eggs on the servers to tell us, upsell us. I wanna be sold stuff. And my wife always knows if there is a creme brulee that has a fun flavor or is a unique twist, I'm ordering it, even if it looks like I'm full. So that's what we're gonna make. We're gonna separate five eggs. And we just need the yolks for right now. And I have the one yolk from our cocktail that we made. And we're starting with the uh, dessert first because it has to go in the oven and then it has to set up in the refrigerator before we can creme brulee it. Okay, now that we have the egg yolks that we need, we're going to Whisk in some sugar. And make sure this is well incorporated, otherwise you'll have firm spots on the yolks. And we are also going to scald our heavy whipping cream. And scalding is just basically getting milk to just below boiling. So you don't want it to be a rolling boil, just a nice hard simmer. So it just brings the temperature up enough. And while we're doing that, some of the other things that are going into the creme brulee, we're gonna have espresso powder, coffee extract, and some dark chocolate. Okay, now that the cream is scalded, we're gonna add our chocolate and stir it around carefully. Get it to melt into a nice smooth consistency. While this is melting, we can add the espresso powder. And we just want to make sure that it's fully melted and all the espresso powder is liquefied, dissolved, I should say. Now that the espresso powder, the chocolate, is all dissolved and nice and smooth, we're going to add it to our egg and sugar mixture. We're going to Stir this while we add it so it doesn't cook the egg yolks. Get it all incorporated. Scrape around the bottom and the sides of the bowl. And then I like to add just a few drops of coffee extract. And you do not need a lot. Unless you're 
insane coffee person and need the coffee, coffee flavor. Third round. And now we can add it to our ramekins. Let me explain what's going on here. So I have a baking dish with four ramekins in and we're going to cook them in a little bit of water in an oven for about 40 minutes at 275 degrees. Um, and you do that so it's a nice gentle heat so you don't um, curdle the eggs in the cream. This creme brulee literally means cooked cream. And it helps to have a baking dish that has a little bit higher sides than the ramekins, or if you have creme brulee dishes that come in different sizes, just so when you put the water in around, you do not have to be really, really super careful trying to get it in and out of the oven once they are set. Alrighty. Okay, now that we have the inner creme brulee dishes in a pan, we have some warm water, and we're going to fill it about half to three quarters away up the side of the creme brulee pans. This is where having a pan with higher sides is helpful. Those will cook about 40 minutes till they're just set. You don't want to have them like cake set where it doesn't jiggle. You actually kind of want it to be, since we're getting up onto Christmas, like the bowl full of jelly of Santa's belly that kind of consistency where if you tap the sides, they still have like a jello-y look to them. So since we have 40 minutes there, we're gonna start on the pan roasted beef tenderloin appetizer with the vegetable jam and blue cheese. Okay, now we're gonna start on the vegetable jam for the pan roasted beef tenderloin appetizer. We're gonna start by actually prepping the leeks that are gonna be frazzled or fried, go on top as a garnish, because they need to rinse and get drained off to make sure there's no sand, because who wants to eat sand? So this is a leek, if you've never had one. It's basically an onion, but with a very mild, kind of almost earthy, aromatic flavor to it. To prep it, we're gonna cut into, I don't know, two inch, section, cut in half, and then we're just going to make julienne strips out of the leek. So one of the questions I get asked all the time when I do in-home dinner parties and cooking classes is how do you cut so fast? And the easiest answer is I've cut literally tons of vegetables in my life. But if you want to practice, hold the knife with your index and your thumb next to the bolster, which is this part of the blade, and rub the blade of the knife along your knuckle. That way, if your knuckle is touching the knife, your brain will know where your knife and your hand are, so it won't let you cut yourself. It's when you start going like this, that's when you start cutting yourself. Alrighty. For today's application, this will be enough leaks, and I got a little bowl of water over here. Slightly lukewarm, helps soften up the leeks a little bit so when we fry them they become nice and crispy. And we'll let these sit and make sure, we'll change the water out a couple of different times to make sure all the sand and other sediment from them growing gets rinsed away and we have a nice clean leek to fry. Then we're gonna start on the jam. So I'm gonna show you real quick how to cut up and brunoise a pepper. I like to cut either end of a pepper off and one of the things that also helps with being able to be efficient with your cutting is make things have flat surfaces. So if a pepper is all rounded, if you flatten it on one side, then you can flatten it on the other side and you can cut with it out rocking back and forth. So you just run the knife through one way, get them all nice and in an orderly line the other way. And then we'll make nice little brunoise. The more you can keep your cuts equal in size, the easier it is to cook because they'll all cook at the same rate. 
If you have some that are really one inch by one inch and then others that are just like this size, these are gonna cook so much faster than the one inch by one inch, your food is not gonna turn out as well. And we have some that were pre-done earlier. We'll add those two. Then we have a hot pan that's been heating. We have a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. We're gonna add a little bit too. Get it so it can be nice and shimmery. And we're not gonna cook these to a hard caramelization or put a lot of color on. We're just gonna sweat them out a little bit. And while those are slowly cooking, we're gonna add a red onion. And again, if you cut both ends off, and remember which side had the root. That's this side. When you cut it in half, and we're going to dice these again. We're gonna to try to keep them the same size. So I'm going to cut this way along the circumference of the onion. And then just that last little bit, we just need to clean up a little bit. And that is a Brunoise onion. Just gonna stir this around a little bit. So this is a dish that is kind of a culmination of all 20 some years of my cooking through different resorts and fine dining establishments throughout the country and the Caribbean where different chefs you work under have different traits and different aspects that they really kind of hone in on and, and, and always kind of go back to and revert to when they write specials or menu items. And what I like about this is it takes jam, which everybody thinks of as a overly sweet dish, into a savory realm, which gives you a nice coating accent ingredient to a dish that you can make as spicy as you want or as savory as you want or roasted garlicky as you want. However you want to do it, you can play with it and make it your own. So we're gonna let this cook just a little bit. While we're waiting for that, we're also going to add a few cloves of roasted garlic. And here's another great little tip. Um, if you can get a whole bunch of peeled garlic, you can put them into a roasting pan with some extra virgin olive oil, leave it uncovered, put it into your oven about 300 degrees so they look like this nice kind of almondy, toasted almondy color. And you can have then roasted garlic and the roasted garlic oil that you can use to flavor salad dressings or finish with dipping with bread or many other uses. Okay, while this is cooking, it's doing nicely. We're going to take some cherry tomatoes. We're gonna to try to get the cherry tomatoes to be the same size. Okay, now that we have the tomatoes cut up, we will add them to the pan. And at the same time, we're gonna add some white sugar, a little bit of white balsamic vinegar, some tomato juice. We're gonna stir this around a little bit. What we will do is we'll let this cook a little bit, turn the heat down, add a little bit of water because we don't want it to be so tomatoey that it's like soup but we want it to be jam consistency. Then I'll go get the tenderloin. We'll, I'll show you how to peel a whole tenderloin and then we'll pan roast some beef tenderloin. Okay, we are ready to trim out a tenderloin and some people this would be a very intimidating task. I'm here to tell you it's not. And if you're gonna do a holiday party or just having a group of friends over for a a football game and want to do steaks, this is a great way to buy a whole tenderloin, skin it out yourself, and save yourself a little bit of money. So this is the head of the tenderloin, this is the tail, and if you pull back on this silver skin a little bit and take a fillet knife or a paring knife, and you can work your way underneath the silver skin, 
twist the knife up towards the silver skin a little bit, and then just slowly work your way to the end. Then this, same thing, there you have a skin tenderloin. And you just keep working wherever you see the silver skin, which is just connective tissue. Remove it, because it's undesirable when you have it as a steak. And flip it over, and just take off a little bit of this fat. And there's a little bit of silver skin right here. And for this application, doing the appetizer, we're just gonna use the head of the tenderloin. So if you look real closely, there's always a seam right about here. The fat from underneath the tenderloin comes up a little bit and it makes a little V shape. And this you can use, the rest of it you can use to cut steaks out of or cut into dices, diced meat for beef tenderloin tips, kebabs, whatever you want to use for an application. Just gonna trim this up a little bit. And this is what we're gonna to use to pan roast for the appetizer. So we're going to season well with pepper, salt, and some fresh cut tarragon. And since we're just putting it right on the beef, it's okay to use the same cutting board. Just a quick rough chop, rub it on the tenderloin, put a little bit of olive oil, wait for a nice little shimmer. It's always the best to have hot pan, hot oil when you saute or sear. And we're gonna add a little bit of whole butter. Let that melt a little bit. And we're gonna keep an eye on our jam over here. You can go ahead and add the tenderloin. And we're gonna let this really get a nice hard sear on all, all the sides. Uh, to make sure it's nice and caramelized brown and we'll really be cooking it the whole way and we're gonna baste it with the juices that accumulate on the bottom of the pan. We'll baste it with those juices to finish the tenderloin all on the stove top. All right, so we have pan roasted the beef tenderloin. We've made the vegetable jam. Our creme brulee is out of the oven. It's cooling off, um, so we're gonna set those all aside because we need to let the beef tenderloin rest. Otherwise, if we cut it right now, the blood and the juices are just gonna run away and we'll lose all that flavor that we worked so hard to sear into the beef tenderloin. So we'll put these to the back counter and work on our entree. And the entree is a prosciutto wrap seared salmon. So again, like the tenderloin, you can save yourself a few dollars if you get a whole salmon, and even if it has the skin on, it's very easy to take the skin off. If you have a long slicing knife or a chef's knife, as long as it's longer than the widest part of the salmon, you're good. Just cut down to where you see the skin, pull it back so it's nice and taut, pull the knife still, and wiggle the skin back and forth and you can remove the skin. For our purposes, we're gonna try to get square medallion fillet pieces. And, but don't throw away the rest that we cut off. Save them, we can use them to make salmon tartare or if you're game enough to try salmon sushi or a nori roll, you can use it for that. Or you can just put into a blender or a food processor, chop it up with some lemon and capers and some onion, make your own gourmet salmon patty for a lunch. Because we're going to trim off the end. And we're gonna to try to get square pieces of really the back of the salmon. Because it's gonna be the most, the same thickness. And like the vegetables, it'll cook more evenly than trying to have the belly piece along with the thicker backside. And we'll do two portions. And again, don't get rid of that. Use it for something. To continue with the salmon entree, we cut our salmon pieces. We have a, a saute pan preheating. We're gonna add a little bit of olive oil, just so we can have enough that when we place the salmon wrapped in prosciutto in it, the prosciutto will get nice and crispy. 
you want to try to keep the slices of prosciutto as big as possible. And what I find is helpful is to lay out the prosciutto on your cutting board first, instead of trying to wrap it freehand or what a chef I used to work under called directing the food. Cause you'd be working up here and not on the cutting board where it's stable. Kind of like a maestro in an orchestra. And the other thing I like to do is do a couple, go one direction and turn the next couple so they're perpendicular. So you have a nice big square of prosciutto. And if you're big into Italian cooking, this is kind of an adaptation of salt and bolca, which is normally a white fish and you normally have sage and Parmesan and we're just gonna do prosciutto and salmon. We're just gonna hit it with a little bit of pepper. And I don't wanna season it with salt at this point because the prosciutto has enough salt in it that it may just be seasoned enough. We'll season the sauce that it goes with the salmon. So one of the first public events I ever did was when I was a chef at the Hilton in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was the Concerts on the Square. And I made a dish similar to this, cooking in front of all the patrons of the orchestra concert that was held on, on the Capitol lawn. And this was kind of a similar dish that I, we had that were frying and searing and we had Many, many people stop by and ask us if we were nuts trying to cook out in front of everybody on the Capitol Square. But it was a fun time. And whenever you add anything to hot oil, make sure you touch it close to you and let it fall away from you. That way, if any oil splatters, it doesn't splatter on you. And I like to also just put a little bit of pepper on top. Just to season the prosciutto a little bit. And we'll let this cook. And for the most part, we'll have this finished in the pan. Okay, so we've, we've let the salmon, the prosciutto get crispy on the bottom side of the salmon. We're just gonna let it flip over and crisp up the other side. And while that happens, we can get started on making the risotto and the cherry tomato ragu, the side and the sauce for the salmon. Okay, so we've put a hard caramelization onto the uh, prosciutto of the salmon. For the most part, they're 90% cooked. And we're just gonna set them aside and we're gonna use the same pan to make the cherry tomato ragu. All this caramelization on the bottom of the pan, that is what you work for. That's called fond. It's a base layer of all great sauces. And we're going to add a little bit of olive oil, just enough to kind of wet the bottom of the pan. And we're going to use maybe four or five tablespoons of butter, and we'll let that melt. And while that is melting, we're gonna take the basil and we're gonna chiffonade it. Chiffonade means torn ribbons. So we're gonna roll up a bunch of leaves and then we're just gonna cross cut them in small little shards. And we can add the red onion and cherry tomatoes to the pan. We'll get them evenly distributed and if you can try to get the cut side of the tomatoes down, that just helps caramelize the cherry tomatoes and give your sauce a nice richness with a little bit of sweet background. Then we're gonna turn this down to a simmer and just let it kind of slowly, the tomatoes will slowly melt away and become part of and make the sauce. We're gonna add the basil and we're gonna add a little bit more basil at the end. And we're also going to mince some garlic. This is fresh garlic. 
just gonna smash it once, run it through with the knife a couple times. You know what, I like garlic. I'm gonna do two cloves. Call me crazy. And if you really wanna have the garlic not be in big chunks, once you get it to this, you can, if you lay your knife flat, put your palm on the tip of the knife, and you can work the knife backwards, and you can literally get it to be um, pureed. It, so it, when you add it to the sauce, it literally disappears. People won't even understand how they can taste all that garlic without seeing any big chunks. While that's going, we're going to get working on cooking the risotto. A couple tablespoons of butter, a little bit of olive oil, and we're going to use a little bit of leek. Since we had a whole leek, we're gonna use some of it to flavor the risotto. And we'll give it a couple of cloves of garlic. A couple key steps to know and understand about risotto is you want to toast the risotto, the rice, the arboreal rice. Arboreal rice is different from like Uncle Ben's long grain white rice or brown rice or basmati in that it's a short fat grained rice. And what happens when you toast the risotto, besides it becoming more almond flavored and gives this wonderful aroma of nuttiness. And I'm gonna go grab the chicken broth that is heating up. And the other thing that makes risotto interesting compared to cooking of all the rice is you start with the liquid and the rice separate, and you add the broth in small additions. Stirring, not constantly, but what seems unnatural if you make white rice on a regular basis. Okay, so we have the seared salmon with wrapped in prosciutto. We have, we're three quarters done with the cherry tomato basil ragu, where risotto is stage three of five. It's almost finished. So we're going to finish the ragu. We're gonna add just a ladle or two of chicken broth. And if you want, you could use shrimp or vegetable broth, whatever you want. And we're gonna bring this up to a boil. And then once it boils, we're just going to um, add some cold butter to give it some body and some nice thickness. We can go on to our risotto. And if you notice, all the grains are really puffed up and they're full of the broth that we've been adding slowly in little parts, about a cup and a half at a time in three or four parts. And it really makes for that really nice al dente, to the tooth, a bite through the outer hull, and then it's a nice, smooth, creamy center texture. So we're gonna do one more ladle of broth, give it a nice stir around, and then we're gonna add some Parmesan Reggiano. And then we're gonna add all the fine herbs. We have oregano, basil, Italian flat leaf parsley, savory, Basically any fresh herbs that you can get your hands on, chop it up and put it in. And we're gonna let this simmer and it'll thicken up and get a nice starchy sauce. Basically with the risotto, it's all that rice starch that can't get back into the um, grains of the rice. It's just hanging out in the broth. We're going to add the salmon into the sauce. And we're gonna add a few tablespoons of butter, cold butter. This is gonna allow the salmon to kind of get back up to temperature for service, plating. And we're also going to be able to impart a little bit more of that prosciutto flavor into the sauce. And once you add the butter, you wanna turn off the heat because the butter will break otherwise. And you don't want a broken sauce. You've worked all this time to make a nice, beautiful sauce. Don't want it to break. And next, we can plate all three courses and get ready to eat, caramelize the creme brulee, and good.
Okay, we're to the point in the program where we can start to plate. But before we do that, we need to finish brulee the creme brulees. So I have a, a unique little sugar mixture. I take brown sugar, light and dark, and equal parts of, so basically if I take a half cup of brown sugar, light, and a half cup of dark brown sugar, I take one cup of white sugar, and I blend it together and make a real fine mixed sugar out of it. I find it makes for a more well-rounded caramel flavor, and it also is a little bit more even of a caramel when you brown your creme brulees. And while that is happening, we will plate the other two entree, or other two dishes. For the appetizer, we're gonna take our pan-roasted tenderloin, Do nice thin slices. Then we're gonna take our tomato jam. Put a little strip right down the middle. Maybe a little pile in the corners in case people wanna have a little bit more. Some Wisconsin blue cheese, since I am from Wisconsin. And if you don't like blue cheese, you can use a cheese of your, of your choosing. And then the frazzle leeks, just to give a little bit of crunch. There we go. And this is our appetizer. Next, we'll plate the salmon entree. On our platter, we'll give one last turn of the risotto. Strip down the center of the platter. Take our two salmon fillets that are wrapped in prosciutto, and then glaze them with the cherry tomato ragu. Now we're just waiting on the creme brulees to caramelize. All right, we're gonna check on the creme brulees, make sure they have a nice caramelized top, and then we're good to eat. And just be careful, they are hot. And we'll just put a few mint leaves on, just for a bit of color. And there we go. Three courses from Cuisine to cocktails with Dinners with Chef, and I'm your chef, James Jens. Join us next time for when we delve into wild game or braised items, who knows? But we'll have a twist on a modern cuisine for you.